From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Hank Lason at Intercommercial, Johnny. Say, did you ever hear the Collegio Diamond? Didn't strike a chord. Worth about 200000 on the open market. It's insured and it's been stolen, right? Well, I can't say definitely that it's been stolen, but it's gone. The owner's name was Benson, lived here in Hartford. Why the past tense? They found him last night in his study. Murdered. Edmund O'Brien in another transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Intercommercial Insurance Companies of America, Home Offices, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Henry Lason. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Collegio Diamond matter. Expense account item one, $1.20 taxi fare to the western part of town where the better homes are situated. Mr. Charles Benson's home was back from the street and encircled with a high, well-trimmed hedge. The black wreath was already on the door. A young lady, very pretty in a black dress, received me in the study. You're Mr. Dollar? That's right. Mr. Lason phoned and said you were on your way. Oh, I hate to bother you a matter like this right now. Uh, Miss Benson, is it? Yes. It's quite all right. Maybe if I go over it all again, it'll help me realize that it's happened. This man's gone. It's still like a bad dream. The beginning was when Dad bought the Collegio Diamond. When was that? About three years ago in Italy. He bought it from a diamond trader who'd just come into Florence from South Africa. Your father had interest there? No. He was just a tourist. He'd heard about this diamond from a friend of his, a collector. He knew the diamond had belonged to a minor official to the Medici, a man named Collegio. It was given to him in return for a favor. Since then, it's passed from hand to hand until Dad bought it. What did he pay for it, do you know? About 200000 Or the Italian equivalent at that time in Lira. But... Mr. Dollar, the diamond has a strange history. Now, don't tell me there's a curse on it. No, nothing like that. But I guess it amounts to the same thing. Everyone who's owned the diamond has died with it in his possession. Died violently. There's nothing particularly mysterious about that. Anything worth as much as that piece of glass is worth killing for. Say, uh, who's living with you here now? My mother. Just the two of us. You have no idea how hard it's been for her, Mr. Dollar. She's hardly been out of her room since... since Dad died. Can you tell me about last night, Miss Benson? Well, I was out with Bob, I can say. We were out till about three. Dad was home alone. He had a habit of reading very late. In this room, as a matter of fact. The light in the study was on when we came in. The only light on in the house. Bob and I went in. Dad's back was to the door. Please go on. He was slumped over in his chair facing the window. His book had dropped to the floor. The wall safe was wide open, and on the desk was the velvet line box the diamond was kept in. The diamond was gone. Dad had a bullet hole in his temple. I see. He kept the diamond right on these premises? Always. We warned him time after time not to. We told him to keep it in his safety deposit box at the bank, but he refused. Always said that a diamond wasn't worth having unless you kept it in your possession and enjoyed it. Who knew about the diamond, Miss Benson? Oh, so many people. Family, of course. Myself, Bob. The papers were filled with the news when Dad came back with it from Italy. Well, I mean, who knew where it was? Who knew the combination of the safe? Nobody but Dad. And, of course, Mother. Oh, yes, and Mr. Corrigan. Who's Mr. Corrigan? Dad's lawyer. Dad kept the will in there and a few other papers that Mr. Corrigan would come and get every once in a while. Well, Corrigan came into the house and got papers out of your dad's safe any time he wanted to? Any time he wanted to. I think I'd better talk to Mr. Corrigan before I go any further. Oh, now, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Corrigan wouldn't have... Probably me. not. But we'd better have a talk just the same. I'd like to have his address, please. <laughs> Expense account item two, 80 cents taxi fare to Main Street where Mr. Corrigan's office was located. An elevator ride and a walk down a marble hall took me to the frosted glass door on which was printed Corrigan and Bishop, attorneys at law. 
I talked myself past the receptionist and the secretary and wound up refusing a cigar from Corrigan himself. You're in the insurance business? The investigation end. I understand you were Mr. Benson's lawyer. That's right. Mr. Benson had the utmost... Oh, excuse me. Yes. No, uh, Vermont Maple. Well, 45000 is way too much. Yes, in board fee. I have them ship it from Montpelier, if that's the case. Well, have them try to get it down, then. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Dollar, Mr. Benson and I were associated for about 15 years in one way or another. We went to school together. It was a terrible shock to learn of it. Oh, excuse me. Who? Oh, put him on. Harry, what's with Chicago? No, no, same thing. No, she's in Arizona. Arthritis. Well, a little better. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And my left, Danny. Oh, okay, you bet, Harry. Yeah, you bet. Sure. Bye. Now, uh, you're here about the diamond or about the life insurance policy? The diamond. Well, the diamond is a very rare item. Whoever got into the safe knew the combination. I understand there weren't many who knew the combination. Well, that's true. Mr. and Mrs. Benson and myself are the only ones. I suppose I'm the prime suspect. But, of course, these safe crackers, they use a stethoscope these days. You probably know more about that than I do. Oh, excuse me. Mm. Who? Oh, yes, put him on. Yes, Jays. Oh, it is? Oh, swell. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? Yeah, very young man. Forty-five. Oh, yes. Terribly upset. Well, yes, she's due here at about, well, any minute now. We're going to make the arrangements. Oh, I wouldn't let her go near the place, no. Well, I certainly tell her. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, you bet. You bet. Yeah, bye. Well, exactly what did you want to know, Mr. Dollar? Anything that would help us locate the diamond. Well, have you talked to the police? No, I thought I'd amble around among the persons involved first. Well, as I say, you probably know more about that than I do. I wish there was something I could say, but the last time I saw George Benson was about two weeks ago. You think this was an outside job? Well, that's my opinion, but it's sheer speculation. Oh, excuse me. Oh, she is? Well, send her in, please. I hope you won't mind, Mr. Dollar. That's Mrs. Benson. I'm taking you down to the dressmaker's. Oh, I see. Uh, why don't you go out that door? Fine. Oh, thanks, Mr. Carrigan. It's quite all right. Anything else I can do, you'll let me know. You bet. I didn't leave. I stood in the little outer room and sneaked to listen through the door. There was some reason why Mr. Carrigan had rushed me out one door while Mrs. Benson came in another one. I heard some things that made the whole case of the collegial diamond a lot more interesting. I pushed the door open a crack. Darling. Oh, Dad. <laughs> you look lovely in black. I'm going out of my mind, all those people calling, having to act unhappy. Well, this is your opportunity to be a real actress. I'm awful at tears. You're beautiful. Please, Dan, what if somebody should see us? Well, let them. Let them see us. What do I care? We're as free as birds. There's a little place down in Bermuda, a resort... I got a folder the other day. Beautiful place to have. You won't believe how beautiful. And as soon as it's proper... What about Kitty? Well, I told her before I left that I wanted a divorce. I told her and she knows it. That's why she went to Arizona. To get away to think things over. I didn't want to hurt her, but I wanted her to know. <laughs> Darling, I can't believe it. <laughs> Too good to be true. But we've got to be careful. Ah. Very careful. Well, let's go. We'll be late. Darling... I love you. On that somewhat touching note, I quietly closed the office door, turned toward the door that would lead me out into the corridor, put my foot to a rough edge of carpet, and promptly fell flat on my face. This brought Corrigan running. I thought you were gone, Mr. Dollar. Uh, I thought so, too. Do you consider it quite ethical listening at keyholes? Didn't you know... Investigation is just a very polite word for snooping, Mr. Corrigan. Who is it, Sam? He's an insurance investigator. You heard everything? Not everything, Mrs. Benson. Just enough to tell me that black is not your color. No, it isn't. I loathe black. Ditto, your husband. I tolerated my husband, Mr. Dollar. You don't have to explain anything to him, darling. He's just an insurance man. 
The police might be interested to know about this little relationship. There are a number of angles here. Could be that you and Mrs. Benson killed Mr. Benson and removed the diamond to make the whole thing look like robbery. Yes, Mr. Dollar, it could be. I welcome any police investigation. Fine, I'll go right over. Uh, wait. I don't think right now would be quite the opportune time. Guilty or not guilty, I have a reputation. In the light of that corny love scene you two just played, I can't imagine why. Mr. Sorry. Dollar. Sorry. Well, what do we do? All stand around embarrassed? Let's have it. Why did I get the rush act out of your office? Well, that's simple, Mr. Dollar. I was afraid that Diane would give away our relationship. He's right. I'm not a very good actress. When did this thing start? Must you know everything? I think so. About seven years ago. The wool you were pulling over Benson's eyes must be pretty worn by now. We did nothing to be ashamed of. I resent this. I resent the whole thing. I don't think I want to tell you anything more, Mr. Dollar. I don't blame you. And you know, it's all kind of dull anyway. I'll go to the police. They'll probably have something much more interesting. Don't worry, Corrigan. I'm not going to breathe a word of this unless I feel it necessary. But I never made it to police headquarters. I got out in the street when a very large, very quiet man in a brown and white sports shirt stopped me. Mr. Dollar? Yes? You like some information? About what? The fifth, the tropical. I never play the ponies. These ponies you play. Hop in. Thanks. No. Oh, come on. Hop in. Is that dangerous, that steel thing in your pocket? How very discerning of you to recognize the outline. Inside. Right. Okay, Bunny. Relax, Dollar. Where are we going? You're going to sleep. <laughs> I awoke with a groan in my own apartment. Nobody was there, but nobody. As soon as I could focus my eyes, I tried to lift myself off the floor. After five tries, I managed to turn my head. What I saw made me want to go back to sleep again. The place was a mess. There wasn't one inch that hadn't been gone over with what must have been a tractor. Every drawer in the place had been turned upside down. The problem was reaching the phone. It was all of ten feet away, but it might have been ten miles. I started to crawl. About halfway to it, I grabbed hold of the cord. I pulled the phone toward me until I got my hands on the receiver. Hello? Hello, Johnny? Hello? Hello? Johnny? Yeah, Johnny. Johnny, you sound awful. Yeah, I can understand it. Well, what'd you find out about the collegial diamond? You were right. About what? It's gone. Well, that's brilliant. Who took it? I don't know. Well, what are you doing to find out? Right now, I'm just lying around. Somebody gave me a tumble. Say, are you drunk? You better send a doctor. I think I'm going to pass out again. Johnny. Johnny. Hello. Johnny. Johnny. I can't talk to you now. I'm not on the phone. I'm here. Huh? Oh. You look funny with foreheads. Well, I might as well put this phone up. Oh, come on. Come on. Stop that nonsense. Now, look, I hate to bother you with business, but what happened to you? I'll tell it all to the police. You think I want the police in on this? Oh, why keep them out? Publicity for the company. I want the public to think Intercommercial is able to take care of itself. Now, come on. What happened? Somebody asked me for a ride. I mean, asked me if I wanted a ride. Then they gave it to me. Well, it looks like they were looking for something. Did you have something they might be looking for? If I had something they were looking for, I wouldn't know it. But they must have thought I had something they were... Look, I'm going round and round already. Ask me no questions. Have you got any idea of what it might be they were looking for? Maybe the diamond. Yeah, see, maybe the diamond. See, that's right, that could be. Now go away. Well, we'll take you off the case and put someone else on. So you can have a nice rest. Oh, oh, no, you don't. Well, I thought that would pep you up. Yeah, money always does. Now get out of here and let me fasten my head back on. Do you want something? Yeah. Get me an ass. Hello? Mr. Dollar? Yeah? This is Betty. Betty Benson. Oh, yeah, sure. How are you? Mr. Dollar, the police have just been here. What happened? They found the gun that killed Dad. Oh, good. Where was it? 
in my purse. We will return to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. For an hour of rapid-fire entertainment, the show goes on. It's a show for you these Friday nights on most of these same CBS stations. It's an intimate glimpse into a fascinating angle of backstage life. A series of honest-to-goodness auditions for jobs in theater, nightclubs, and radio. The singers and comedians you hear are face-to-face with managers, agents, and bookers ready to hire them on the spot, take an option, or turn thumbs down. Be sure to hear The Show Goes On and its latest act this Friday night. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account item three, taxi fare again. One dollar and thirty cents to the Hartford City Jail where an old buddy of mine by the name of Lieutenant Parnell was quizzing Miss Benson with the nastiest bunch of leading questions I've ever heard. Now, why did you kill your father, Miss Benson? Oh, come on, come on. We'll make it much easier for you if hey, you hey, only... Hey, 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 Parnell. Come on, give her a break. Oh, the insurance man. I wondered when you'd be over. Hey, what happened to your head? When I find out, I'll let you know. Don't let him talk you into a thing, Betty. Get a good lawyer. Well, for one thing, Corrigan is on his way over. For another, the best lawyer in the world couldn't do her any good. The gun had her prints all over it. Would I put a murder weapon in my purse with my fingerprints on it, Lieutenant? Now, would I? If you didn't have time to get rid of the gun, why not? You're getting woozy, Lieutenant. Why don't you take a break? They've got the Giants game on the radio out there. Why not go out and see how they're doing? No, no, no. I might miss something, darling. Uh, maybe you can do better with it than I can. I'll just sit down over here and listen. All right, now, how's that? Fine. Okay, now, Betty. How did the gun get into your purse? I don't know, Mr. Dollar. The lieutenant was searching through my room and found this purse. There it was. But I didn't carry that purse the night Dad was killed. I haven't used that purse in a long time. Somebody put the gun in there. Can you prove it? Well, no. Nobody saw you that evening, huh? Nobody but Bob. Bob, your boyfriend, huh? All right, now I've got the necessary papers. You leave her alone. Dollar, what are you doing here? I just came over to add to the confusion. Betty, Betty, are you all right? Hello, darling, I'm all right. This looks like Grand Central Station. Come on, Betty. We'll have you out of here in jig time. This is Bob Gorman, my fiancé, Mr. Dollar and Lieutenant Parnell. Hello, how are you? Yeah, that was nice. Like a Washington hostess. Now, let's try to wind this thing up. Mr. Corrigan, were you anywhere in the vicinity of the Benson home the night Mr. Benson was murdered? Absolutely not. Oh, yes, you were. You were visiting Betty's mother. That's a deliberate lie. I was nowhere near... I don't know why I'm submitting to intimidation from you, Gorman. Seems to be a little difference of opinion here, Lieutenant. Mm Mm-hmm. You were quite a comfort to Mrs. Benson during the period of her bereavement, weren't you, Corrigan? I refuse to answer on the grounds that it might incriminate me. You're darn right it would incriminate you. The way you've been carrying on with Mrs. Benson, everybody knows about it. No, I'm going to get it off my chest. Betty's father was no sooner dead than he was hustling Mrs. Betts in this place and that Why, place. you young... Uh, 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 uh. Temper, temper, Mr. Corrigan. I'd save that for the jury. He can't make accusations like that. They aren't just accusations, Mr. Corrigan. They're true. Nobody had a better reason to kill Dad than you did. Love, huh? Say, anybody in this room happen to know where the Collegio Diamond is? No. no. Huh. I didn't think so. But well, if you like Carr, to know... Hold it. Well, but... I just wanted to say goodbye to you. Okay, now go ahead. If you'd like to know why they can't handle it, now wait. Expense account item four, $12.20 miscellaneous taxi fares all over the place. I went on a little visit to Corrigan's apartment and found something of interest. A little clip of paper on which was written in the highest form of legal language, of course. I owe you $2,000, George Benson. I worked my way into Bob Gorman's apartment. There, I found a bill from the Garant Detective Agency. Then to police headquarters again, where I found a picture of a man who was tall and thin and had a little, well-trimmed mustache. Then I went home, where I found a man who was tall, thin, and had a little, well-trimmed mustache. He was drinking my bourbon. You're drinking my bourbon. Lousy bourbon. Look what you did to my head. An improvement. All right, what do you want? The diamond. What else? I don't have it. I don't believe it. Well, search the place. I already did. 
Well, I guess that does it. I'll see you later. Don't go. Out of the way. I said don't go. You, you crazy. Okay. Drop the gun. Let go. Now, sit down and finish your drink. I didn't come here alone. If I'm not downstairs in three minutes, you'll come up. The more the merrier. Who do you work for? Myself. That's right, friend. I want all the excuse I can get to beat the pulp out of you. Go on. Now, now, cut it. Who do you work for? Corrigan. What's the deal? He wanted me to get the gun. So you planted it in Betty's purse. I didn't. And I didn't kill Bench, neither. I went to get the gun, but it was gone. And I thought you had it, but you didn't have it. So you were working for Corrigan? Yeah. Okay. Now let's start all over again. <laughs> Who do you work for? I told you, Corrigan. This isn't going to be much fun for you, friend. Now, listen, lay off of me. I'm telling you the truth. I tell you the truth and you keep on hitting me. Now, that ain't fair. Who do you work for? Oh, okay. Mrs. Spence. What's the deal? She hired me to get the diamond. Why? She killed her husband so she'd get away with Corrigan. She wanted me to break in and get the diamond so it looked like robbery, see? Robbery and murder, see? Here we go again. (laughs) Will you leave me be? I can keep this up all night if I have to. Why don't you tell me who you think I work for, then, instead of beating up on me? I want to hear it from you. Look, chum, since you knocked me on the head, I get spells of bad temper. All right. All right. The guaranteed take it easy. Now we're getting someplace, Vic. How did you know my name? Well, it's a byword in every precinct police station from here to Ishpeming. You were hired by Bob Gorman. I was hired by Bob Gorman. You killed Benson. I don't know who killed Benson. What were you hired for? To get the diamond. Bob's got it in his apartment. Do I start working on you again? No, no, no. Don't don't act so tough now. Well, who's got the diamond? Corrigan. Look, if you've got all the answers, what are you asking me for? Vic, my boy, I'm amazed. I've seen liars in my time, but I've never run across anything like you. How can you do it with such a straight face, huh? Here's a practice. (laughs) Now I'll tell you the truth as you see it. Don't you hit me no more now. Bob Gorman hired you. That's the truth, all right. And he hired you to get the diamond. But you didn't find the diamond there. You found Benson dead. I walked in there. I'm telling you, I was never more surprised in my life. There was Benson in that chair. I I hired out to do a lot of things. But murder, that's not for me. There ain't money enough in the world to make me commit murder. Slugging, you do. Mm, For good money. Dick, I'm not interested in who killed Benson. Personally, I don't think you know. I want to know where the diamond is. How do I know where the diamond is? It was gone when I got there. I thought you had it. That's why I slugged you. Period. All right, Dick. I'm tired. I got a splitting headache. Finish your drink and get out of here. Uh, No, thanks. It really is lousy bourbon. Things were as dark as ever. Vic was no help. I knew Bob hired him, but that was all I knew. The next stop seemed to me to be Bob himself. I called him and told him to come over. He was very accommodating. A half hour later, he was tapping gently at my door. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Come on in. Don't mind the dirty glass on the table there. I just got through entertaining one of your employees. One of my employees? I believe he said his name was Vic. Vic Hastings. I never heard of him. Come on, Bob. You can be yourself with me. Vic talked to me like a brother. I never heard of it. You may not be conscious of it, Bob, but you're in plenty of trouble. The police are looking for the diamond, and they're sure whoever has the diamond killed Mr. Benson. I'm just an insurance investigator. I have nothing to do with the police department. All right, Mr. Dollar, I did hire Vic Hastings. I sent him after the diamond. He thought I had it. Yes. When he found out you didn't, he came back and threatened me. He wanted money. I didn't have any, but I told him I'd give him a cut when I got it. Is this a regular business of yours, stealing diamonds? Look, Mr. Dollar, I didn't kill Mr. Benson. I didn't ask you that. I asked you about the diamond. I heard about the diamond when Mr. Benson bought it. I had to have it. I I wasn't going to sell it, not then. I just wanted it. I crashed a party at the Benson house about four or five months ago. I met Betty, and I started to date her. That's as good a way as any. Well, you've got it wrong, Mr. Dollar. Sure, I wanted to get at the diamond. That's, That's why I started taking Betty out. But things are different. I love her. We want to get married. Very sweet. Only you didn't hire Vic to get the diamond four or five months ago, Gorman. So get that pleading look out of your eyes. You don't do a thing to me. You're not going to the police. Put it down, Gorman. Stay where you are. Don't try to follow me or I'll blow your head off. So long, darling. Arnell speaking. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. Better send out a code one on Bob Gorman. What do you want it for? Well, you can call it suspicion of murder. It's 
Benson's account, item 5, 120, taxi fare to the Benson home. I found Mrs. Benson in a sad state upstairs due to her husband's death and her daughter's incarceration. Why must you pester me about a thing like this now, Mr. Dollar? Haven't you any consideration? Sorry, Mrs. Benson, but it's a job. The sooner we get over this hurdle, the better off we are. Now, I know all about your relationship with Sarah. All of that has nothing to do with the case. Well, perhaps not. I know who killed my husband, and I know why, and I know who has the diamond. Who? I can't prove it. I couldn't take it into a court of law. Well, let me worry about that. What's your idea, Mrs. Benson? Bob Gorman. Why do you think he did it? He has a violent temper. He hated George. He hated him like poison. George never wanted him to marry Betty. Sorry, that motive doesn't click with me. Now, let me tell you who killed your husband. You and Corrigan. How dare you? You wanted to get rid of him. You two are the only ones who knew the combination of the state. You took the diamond and killed Benson. Why, you... And you planted the gun in Betty's purse. Do you mean to suggest that I would try to make my own daughter out to be a murderer? That's just what you hoped the police would think, that if anybody were framing your daughter, it wouldn't be you. You knew the police would clear Betty because she was nowhere near the house when the murder occurred, and you thought they'd assume that Bob Gorman planted the gun in Betty's purse. That's a lie. Come on, Mrs. Benson. It's all out in the open now. Stay where you are, Dollar. Corrigan, I was expecting you. You're pretty good at this business of investigation, aren't you? It's a shame to have to end such a brilliant career. Hmm? That's the way it goes. Here today, gone tomorrow. You aren't going to mess up Mrs. Benson's pretty bedroom, are you? Not at all. We'll just go out the back way. Open the door, Dollar. Glad to. After you! you. He's all right, Mrs. Benson. Come on, get up, Corrigan. The lieutenant is waiting. In case you should ask, how did you know, Mr. Dollar, that Corrigan and Mrs. Benson killed George Benson? The answer? I took a big guess. I told them my guess, and with the authority of an Illinois judge, they swallowed it and they confessed. To wind it all up, I might add the following. They got Bob Gorman. He's being sent up along with Vic Hastings. His police record makes Vic's look like a bad report card, which means Betty is going to have to look for a new boyfriend. The insurance company has saved a good deal of money. Everybody bad goes to the penitentiary. Everybody good stays free, which proves that bluff is better than logic. This time, anyway. Expense account item six, doctor bill and miscellany for my sore head amounting to $25. Expense account total... $65.34. $65.34. And that's pretty cheap. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role. Is written by Gil Dowd and David Ellis with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Columbia Pictures production, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in our cast this evening were Wally Mayer, Jane Webb, Bill Johnstone, Virginia Gregg, Stacey Harris, Bill Boucher, and Harry Bartell. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. Join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns in another transcribed adventure of... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. down for the count on Friday night with two of CBS's top thrillers. Broadway is my beat and up for parole. Heard over most of these same CBS stations. The gay white way is the scene for many an exciting criminal chase with Danny Clover on Broadway is my beat. In the actual files of parole boards across America come the stories of men and women who are up for parole. For a thrill and a chill, Broadway is my beat and up for parole, fill the bill. This is CBS, where you thrill to gangbusters every Saturday night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.